Come in. Welcome. I am E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the sound of suspense, to the fear you can hear. Our tale is a blood-freezing story inspired by a nursery rhyme, a sweet, simple song. Ring a ring of roses, a pocket full of poses. Achoo, achoo, we all fall down. It sounds young and innocent, doesn't it? But it is very old and very sinister. For the ring a ring of roses were the splotches that first appeared on the faces of those afflicted during the Black Plague. The pocket full of poses were the herbs that were carried hopefully to ward off the fatal disease. The sneezing sounds, achoo, achoo, were the sounds of the final spasms. And we all fall down was, well, you can guess. Our mystery drama, A Ring of Roses, was written especially for the Radio Mystery Theater by S.J. Wilson and stars Glynis O'Connor. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Science has brought most plagues under control, but not so those other epidemics of the past those that plague us with their unseen, unknown, and unexpected terrors. And such is the tale of terror you are about to hear. Draw close to the guttering candle, for you will receive no warmth from a ring of roses. Oh, you know, George, I've heard about this place so often from Helena. I'm just dying to see her home. And I'm anxious to meet your friend, Helena. Oh, I'm sure you'll like her. But will she like me? Taking her best friend away from her. <sighs> Come on, George. <laughs> you know you're irresistible. <laughs> Why do you think I'm going to marry you? Well, for one thing, my beautiful, exquisite, enormous pots of money. <laughs> <laughs> oh, George, wait. Uh, Look, stop. Laurie, get your hands off the wheel. What do you think you're trying to... Do. But we passed it. It's the sign to the house. Back there. Now, Laurie. Laurie, I never want you to do that again. I'm not going to let missing a sign risk your getting hurt. You understand? I'm sorry. I shouldn't have grabbed the wheel that way. All right, forget it. But please, never again, ever. And that is supposed to be the sign... Helena warned that we might miss it. Well, why would anyone use a rose-colored stone in a brass oval with no name or any identification on it for a house sign? Well, their name is Roston. And Helena said that generations back when their family first moved to America, it was rose stone. And so they put up a rose stone. <laughs> well, if they want people to get that meaning from it, they either enjoy guessing games or, more likely, just want to keep themselves very, very private. Yes. Guess what? As you said, they, they are very private. Well, I got that impression before we got here. And I also have the feeling that they're not very friendly, either. Oh, how can you say that? When Helena's mother especially invited us over because she personally wanted to give us our engagement gift. Yes, and that's pretty peculiar, too. How? How many parties, I mean showers, did your girlfriends give you? Four, right? No, three. The last one was a dinner. All right. And Helena was invited to every one, but she... I know, George. She didn't turn up for any of them. You know, Laurie, I've never seen you so wound up. What's spinning around in that pretty head of yours? Well, I, I don't know, but... Well... I am on edge. About what? I I guess about meeting Helena's mother. You see, she she's so strange. She seems so powerful and so terribly uncompromising. I was trying to change things for Helena and 
And then I let her down by becoming engaged to you. Well, now don't tell me you weren't going to marry for poor Helena's sake. Well, at least not until she married first. We were going to share an apartment together in the city. You know what I'm going to do, Laurie? I am going to turn this car right around and head back to the city. This whole trip is more foolish than funny. Oh, no, George. Please don't. Hey, what's that? You hear something like, like, like singing? Let me open the window. It's a woman singing that old nursery rhyme. A two. We all fall down. But what's that snapping ring, sound? Ring, it sounds it's like a piece of leather. It sounds like a whip. George, what are you doing? I'm getting out. Something's happening here that I don't, don't like. Don't open the door. Please don't. We'll go back if you want to. I'll be right back. Keep the window shut and the door's locked. No, don't leave me, George. I'm coming with you. Wait. Okay, but stay close to me. Ring a ring of roses. Well, it seems to be coming from behind those hedges. You know, it could be just kids playing games. If that voice is coming from a kid, he's using a bullhorn. Let's stop here. We might see through the hedge. Please be careful. Holy Toledo. Look at that. Let me see. That man. The old man with the beard. He's trying to catch the girl with his whip. Well, she's teasing him. She's making fun of him. If he lands that wagon whip on her, he'll split her face open. Look at their clothes, George. They're dressed like settlers. Back in the early 1800s. Yeah. You know, they could be rehearsing a play. If they are, he's lost his mind and his part. That man's going wild with that whip. But she's provoking him. Why doesn't she stop? Hey! Hey, you there! What are you two doing? George, you shouldn't have done that. And who is it who is ordering me and questioning me? I am. Over here. That's a terrible thing you're doing. Oh, George, please don't go in there. They know we're here. We must meet them. That's a dangerous whip you're using. That young woman can be killed by it. I see by your clothes you are a stranger. And I can also see that you are a kind human who wishes no harm to come to another. But this, this wench is my daughter. And what I am doing is the true way to gain the obedience of a child who will stray. But what in heaven could she have done to deserve being whipped? I did no harm to no person or to him. I have broken no law of God or man. Strumpet, hold your witch's tongue. Believe me, young woman, when I tell you that she has the demon in her, playing and wenching with the young master who owns this land. While I'm out here working at clearing their forest lands, she's up there in the great house with her enticements and tricks and enchantments. And if it has already come to this, that he has given her a gift for favors promised or already bestowed, the gift of a ring. An already cursed ring. He gave it to me fair and with the holy vow that he will marry me in the month of the next full moon. Marry you, Willie. You who can have fair to read and write. You who are lower than his mother's kitchen scullion. You give me that ring. I won't. I swear by the name and the soul of my sainted mother that you will never get this ring. And until I do, though it mean your own death, you get the whip. Stop it! <gasps> Don't! Why can't you be a little more reasonable? She may be telling you the truth. I am. I swear it on my dead mother's Bible, I am. Well, then, if you are, why don't you give him the ring and let your young man personally tell your father of his plan? No! No, he'll do no thing like that. He'll bury the ring in some secret spot and drag me away before the fall of night. For he doesn't want me to marry, to no one but to stay with him and clean and cook and wash for the rest of his devil life. As you can see, she's beyond talking of matters with sense and decency. She's been taken up with her planning and scheming to get away from me for the purpose of harlot's gain. And she hardly of marrying him. I'll kill you. Uh, George! Uh, she has an uh, axe! Uh, an axe! Uh, She's going stop, to kill him! Stop! For God's sake, stop! Uh, oh, oh, George, I can't look! Uh, Dead! She killed her own father! Uh, 
Where, where is she? What happened to her? There she is. She's running away. Hey! Hey, come back! Come back! You can't get away! It's you who will never get away. The ring will circle you. George! George, don't try to catch her. She's like the wind. I'll never get my hands on her. She's almost in the forest. Come back. Come back. We're not going to hurt you. It's you who are going to be hurt. She's, she's disappeared. Uh, even before she got to the forest. But, George, look what I found. It's the ring. She dropped the ring. Let me see it. You know what it's like? It's just like the road sign. Well, it, it's the same shape. The same color stone. It's smaller, but it is just like the road sign. Rose colors. George, George, we've got to get help. The police, is somewhere. That where? where? Well, of course, the house. We've got to get to Helena's house. <laughs> This ring so rosy, this ring so red, does it belong to the living or the dead? We'll return shortly with Act Two. Is you alone? I don't want to disturb your mother. My dear, you're not disturbing me in the slightest. This room has no secrets. Its acoustics are incredible. I'm Helena's mother. Hello, Mrs. Roston. We've just had a very, a very unusual experience. Laurie's pretty badly shaken by it. Yes, so I see. Helena, why don't you take Laurie to your room, let her refresh herself? Perhaps Mr. Williamson will tell me something more about what's happened? I think the police should be notified at once. The police? Here? Did you have an accident? Well, not exactly, but we happened to see something that can only be described as uh, gruesome, I guess. And the police should be notified. Mother, do you think... Helen, dearest, this is not the time for speculation. I shall be glad to have the deputy's office call. But can you give me some indication of what they're to be told? We don't like bothering our officers unnecessarily. They have enough to do as it is. But someone's just been murdered. Oh, no, not again. What? Now, Helena, restrain yourself, dearest. Laura, you say someone's been murdered. Who? Well, we don't know who he is, but he was trying to whip a young woman. And, Mr. Williamson, she took an axe and killed him. You know, how could you? I was praying that it wouldn't happen to you. Oh, Poor Lori. Now, why don't you young people make yourselves comfortable? A glass of sherry might calm you. But, Mother, you told me that it would never happen again. That thing... Helena, I said I had taken every precaution not to have it happen. But who am I to promise I will control the uncontrollable? Are you saying that this has happened before? Lori, maybe Mrs. Ralston wants to explain. Oh, well, not really, but I feel I'm obliged to... However, it is difficult. How does one explain the inexplicable? I think they're ghosts. There are no ghosts, Helena. Dr. Medvig, the last scientist I consulted, said it was undoubtedly an instance of photoly sensory projection. Helena pooh-poohs it. But uh, has either of you ever heard of that discipline? Oh, vaguely. It once came up in a course on parapsychology that I had at school. No one has ever proved PSP, Mother. Well, they've never proved ESP either, but a lot of serious scientists work with it. But, but George, what does that photo whatever mean? <laughs> it's quite complicated. Photolysis is the means by which light can affect the arrangement of chlorophyll grains in leaves. Chlorophyll grains? Leaves? There's a man not more than a mile from here who's been murdered. Now, calm yourself, my child. There is no such man and no such daughter. This has happened before. I've seen it. Helena has. A very few close friends have. Unfortunately, you have too. Uh, Mr. Williamson, 
Do you think you'd still like to try an explanation of PSP? <laughs> well, it's spooky in a way. By that I mean the, the scientific explanation of it. You see, we're all supposed to give off certain light and heat waves. And what is it happens in the case of individuals who are emotionally stimulated, uh, let us say, people in love? Well, the theory has it that people in a very intense emotional state give off more highly concentrated waves. Well, I just don't understand what chlorophyll and, and leaves and, and light waves have to do with a man being murdered. You see, it's tied up with photosynthesis. And scientists aren't sure how that process really works. But with the unusual intensity of light, the cells of chlorophyll rearrange themselves and are forced to give off some of the excess carbohydrates in which there is an unusual amount of stored energy. I'm not following this at all. My dear, Helena speaks of you as having the patience of a saint. <laughs> so, if you'd like me to telephone the deputies, I suggest you give your fiancé a chance to finish. There isn't much more, Laurie. Just at the openings in the leaves, they're called stomates, tend to react like projectors. And through the magnification of additional oxygen are supposed to be able to relay an episode they once absorbed when they were in the receptive state, like, uh, like film. Are, are you talking about something, something like motion picture film? Yes, Laurie, but it means something like a projector with a memory. A memory of blood in this case. Well, it happens that chlorophyll is very much like hemoglobia except that it contains magnesium instead of the iron found in blood. Are you saying that what we saw was a motion picture? Nothing more? Well, essentially, that's it. But when and where the original was recorded, we have no idea. Well, but there's a building. There's a cabin out there. And there's a man's body bleeding. Why don't you go and see for yourself if you don't believe us? No, Laurie, there's nothing there. Helena, you too? Yes, as Mother said, I've seen it. Others have too. Around here, they call it the Enchanted Forest. But if you go out there again, you won't find a cabin or a man. Nothing. The police know all about it. They'll come and you'll just feel foolish. I... I don't know what to think. It all seemed so real. Well, now, why don't we come back to the present and the truly real? Because I have the real pleasure of giving you our gift to celebrate your engagement. It's a complete surprise. Even I don't know what it is. Laurie, dear, it isn't that what we're giving you is expensive or valuable. But it is dear to us. We hope it will be your first family heirloom. Here it is. No pretty wrapping, but it seems too lovely a box to cover with silly paper. Mother, I've never seen that box before. Well, now, isn't it nice that I can still have some surprises for you? That's a great-looking box, Mrs. Ralston. Those, uh, those are roses painted on ivory, aren't they? Oh, it's so beautiful. I feel as if I'm depriving you of something very special if, if I accepted it. Oh, no. Please, take it. It's, it's little enough, and you know what I think that box would be perfect for? It already has its purpose, dear. What I was going to say was that it would be the perfect place to keep a lock of your first baby's hair, wouldn't it? And I'm afraid it's going to stay empty for some time. Oh, George, we don't know that. Not yet. We will have to find you another container for that when the time comes. This box already has its occupant. You mean there's something inside? Well, look and see. Well, go ahead, Laurie. <laughs> My heart's beating so loudly. <laughs> She's been like that all day, so excited. Darling, do you want me to open it? No, no, I'm all right. <sighs> Just let me take a deep breath. Oh, no. Hey, that's... That's the same... Laurie? What, what's wrong? Mother? Oh, it's his music! Give me the box, Laurie. And inside! Inside! Oh, the ring! Oh! Oh, I've got her. Put her on the couch. Yes. Laurie? 
Lori. Mother, do something. Don't just stand there. Eleanor, control yourself and get some water. Oh, Lori, my poor Lori. Wake up. Lori, come out of it, honey. Darling? She's trying to open her eyes. Slowly, Lori. It's me, George. Oh, who? What, what happened? You just passed out for a moment. Here, give her this water. Here, honey. Sip this slowly. I don't need it. But did I really see it? See what? The ring. Yes. Yes, I've got it. What what ring? This ring. The same one. With a rose-colored stone. Mother, how dare you? That's mine. You know what that ring means to me. Oh, please take that thing away. I don't want to look at it. Don't worry. You won't have to. Here, Mrs. Ralston, take it back. And I hope it isn't a sample of your sense of humor. Just one moment, Mr. Williamson. I don't particularly appreciate your tone or your attitude. What do you mean by my sense of humor? If you and your daughter know all about that axe-murdering scene that we saw earlier, then you must have known about the ring. What about it? It's mine. That ring. It's just like that road sign you have on the highway. Yes, the sign was copied from the design of the ring. It's been our family hallmark, so to speak, for generations. Is that why the girl who killed her father did it? Because of that ring? What do you mean? She had it. She she teased him with it while, while she sang that song. That same nursery rhyme in the box. Oh, oh no. Uh, that couldn't be... That's my ring. She couldn't have had it. Are you too sure you saw this ring? Well, that girl in the field. She dropped it when she ran away. Then where is it now? Well, George, you had it. What? You sure? I I thought you put it into your purse. Well, I'll look. Well, it isn't in any of my pockets. No, and it's not here in my purse. How could it be? There is only one ring, this ring. It's been in the Ralston family for generations. It was brought here by a Ralston early in the 18th century. And it has always belonged to the oldest child in each family. In which case it would be your daughter's, since you are a Ralston by marriage. Yes, that would be so if it were true. Uh, You're not going to tell them. Well, why not? It's time that silly cloud you've been hiding behind was blown away. Don't, Mother, please, I beg you, don't. Nonsense. I am a Roston. That ring belongs to me. Helena's father died in the Southeast Asian War. Shot down even before he knew I was going to have a child. Mother, I hate you for this. I hate you. Helena, don't say that to your own mother. Why not? She's hated me ever since she learned that her father and I had never married. Imagine that in this day. A girl making such a fuss about legitimacy. Stop it, Mother, please. We don't have to hear any more, Mrs. Oh, Austin. yes, yes, you do. George, can't we get out of here quickly? You can go whenever you like, Miss Thornton. But out of your friendship for Helena, you must take that ring with you. No, I couldn't. I won't let her give it to me. Helena, what are you doing? The ring, she tore it out of my hand. I've got it and no one will ever get it from me. Let her go. She'll be back. And with the ring, she knows it's wrong for her to have taken it. Eventually, the ring must come to you, Laurie. We don't want it. But it will come to you. It can do you no harm. It's a silly superstition, but only Rostens is supposed to be vulnerable to the ring. And, Laurie, if you are Helena's friend, as you say you are, you will take it. But she wants it. She insists that it stay hers. Only as an excuse. But what sort of an excuse could the ring give her? The excuse not to marry. And why not? She considers herself fated, ill-starred, if you will. You see, at one time, the superstition arose that if the firstborn was female, the ring would prevent her from marrying. It's high time that ring is out of Roston hands. Why don't you just throw it away? What, with Helena carrying on as if possessed? Well, we just do not want it. I'm sorry, but we must get back to the city. Uh, Yes, it's a long drive, and we'd like to make it before dark. I regret this has turned out to be so unpleasant. 
But then perhaps it couldn't have been avoided. Perhaps. But it's over now. George, let's go. Oh, I can't get away fast enough. I don't know what the speed limit is here, but whatever it is, we'll break it. Helena, I order you to come out of your room at once. At once. Mother, don't hurt her. She is my only friend. The only friend I have in the whole world. Run from the ring. Run for your life. But without a ring, what's a husband or wife? We'll return shortly with Act Three. Let us try and penetrate the shrouding darkness of the final act of A Ring of Roses. Laurie and George have been plunged into a strange, unreal experience. As the twilight lowers over the countryside, they are fleeing from the Rostons, the malevolent nursery rhyme, the flashing axe, the avenging curse, the fatal ring. What can flight outrace those forces of evil? That woman at Mrs. Rostin. She's monstrous. Oh, I'm so sorry for Helena. Yeah, well, I didn't see any halos around her head either. Yeah, but just imagine having to live with that mother. Why does she have to tell Helena that she and her father never married? Do you believe it? Well, why would she lie about something that important? Maybe out of just plain malice. Or or what? It just occurred to me. Couldn't she have invented that story about the curse the ring puts on firstborn Roston girls? Well, to what end? Simple. It'd be a guarantee that she'd never be alone. That she could hold on to her daughter for life. Like the woodcutter. Oh, don't remind me of him. Anyway, I can't see how the ring and whatever it's supposed to do fits. Well, if she made up the business about fate keeping her from marrying Helena's father, now wouldn't that be a kind of evidence, proof for Helena that the curse was real? Well, then why would she give us the ring? Well, I'm only guessing, but couldn't it have been Mrs. Roston's way of telling her daughter that she wouldn't marry even if the ring was off the premises, so to speak? But, George, whatever we think of Mrs. Roston, she's still a mother. And what mother would sentence her daughter to a lifetime of misery? Huh? Look, I'm sorry I got you into this mess. I didn't dream it would be that horrible. Well, you had no way of knowing. Well, looking back, I should have. Helena, always so strange, so withdrawn, so mysterious about herself, her home, and, and her mother. It should have been a warning. Honey, let's find a happier subject. Such as? Well, let's see. Uh, okay, it's not original, but it'll do. For instance, if and when we have our first baby, would you want a boy or a girl? Oh, don't be corny. Why not? Corn is fine as long as it's... George! A... George, isn't there someone in the road? Where? Well, look, straight ahead. Oh, yeah, that's a woman. Uh... Well, we're not stopping for man or beast or any mixture of the two. Here, that should get her off the road. Because if it doesn't, then she may be another bit of PSP and we can drive right through her. Darling, slow down. She's waving at us. George, slow down! No way. If that's a living body and it wants to stay that way, she'll get off the road. Oh, please. She isn't moving from the middle of the road. Damn her teeth, whoever she is. George, George, you're going to hit her. Uh, Laurie, all right? Yeah, I think so. That stupid woman. It's Helena. Yeah. Well, just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Lori, Lori, please, I must speak to you. Tell her you'll phone her on Halloween. Hey, wait, Lori, don't lower the window. Well, she's in trouble. Better her than you. There can't be any danger in finding out what she wants. Haven't you been through enough? Helena, we're in a hurry. Telephone Lori tomorrow. No, don't go, please. Let me explain. George, wait I don't a, have the heart wait a to... Minute. Is, are you sure that's Helena? 
Well, of course. Her face, it, it looks so strange. Well, what's strange about her face? Look at her eyes. They're, they're washed out. They're sunken as if... as if she's taken some kind of drug. That's probably because she's been crying. I'm lowering the window. And you're also raising my temper. Well, what do you want me to do? Just wave goodbye and we'll get going. Oh, she's gone to the front of the car now, George. Oh, she does look dreadful. Why not? She is dreadful. I've got to find out what she wants. Just one minute. Let me talk to her for just only one minute. Okay. Sixty seconds. But don't lower the window more than an inch. Helena? Helena, over here. Now, what is it? Oh, thank you, Laurie. If you only knew how miserable I am about what happened today. It was all my fault. You don't have to apologize. It wasn't anybody's uh, fault. Mother had only the best intentions in giving you the ring. Sure she did. Nothing like unloading something on a couple of strangers that isn't yours to give away. But the ring does belong to her mother. Only to be given to her child, which excludes you. Well, that's true, but... You see, after me, there won't be any Rostons. But you will marry, Helena. Just wait and see. I doubt it. And even if I did, my children won't be Rostons. Helena, this has been the weirdest day in my life. Now, frankly, the sooner we get away from here, the better off we'll feel. Just one more thing. Prove to me that you are still my friend and... Please, take the ring. No, Helena... Thank you, but I couldn't. Absolutely not. Helena, why don't you just throw that ring away somewhere? I can't. I'm not allowed to. It has to be given to a Roston or, or to the person closest and dearest to me. But how could you expect me to take it? Every time I'd look at it, I would remember that terrible scene in the woods. I swear, the ring has nothing to do with what happened out there. It never has before. This is the first time. And it'll be the last for us. Okay, Helena, stand away from the car. I'm backing up. Laurie, if you don't take the ring, I'll die. I know I'll die. You won't die, Helena. Why should you? Because it will mean that I've lost my only friend and that I'll have no one to turn to and I'll be stuck here in this prison with my mother. And she'll never let me go. Never. So long, Helena. If I return to the house with the ring, my mother will do something terrible. If you don't take the ring, I'll throw myself in front of the car. I don't care anymore. I don't care. Helena, give me the ring. Oh, you mean you will take it? Oh, Laurie, you've made me so happy. I'm indebted to you forever. Forever. You're angry with me, George, aren't you? No. I'll probably never see her again. And if it meant that much to her... What probably meant even more to her was that she could twist and bend you in any way she wanted. Well, in a way, it was her last hope of getting out of that house. That's why I finally took the ring. Actually, what harm could it do? I don't know, Laurie, except that anything connected with the Rostons seems dangerous. That's because the Rostons are difficult to understand or explain. Well, that may be. But while we might never get to the bottom of that axe job in the woods, there must be a key somewhere to the Rostons. After all, they're not ghosts or optical illusions. They're people, living, breathing humans. Still, for all we know about them, they're just as haunted as that phantom woodcutter and his crazy daughter. Let's stop talking about them. I will. If you do me an important favor. If I can. You can. Throw that ring away. You mean now? Right this second. Open the window and throw it out. But why? Honey, I consider it a special favor to me if you got rid of that ring. Well, I have no intention of keeping it. But I I don't want to just throw it away. What do you want to do with it? Give it away. To whom? I haven't thought yet. Try thinking about it right now. You sound as if you're ordering me to do it. Actually, I'm begging you, Laurie, begging you to get rid of the damn ring. I said I would. But when? When I find someone to give it to. Someone who would appreciate it. It just doesn't make sense to just throw away something that's probably valuable for just anyone to find or... 
to have it crushed under a car. <sighs> Say, I know what I could do with it. Drop it, Laurie. It's only going to get us into an argument. No, I'm serious, honestly. I just thought of where this ring could do the most good. Fine, you do what you want with it, but let's not talk about it. Oh, you'll agree. I bet you will. Oh, honey, do you realize that since we've known each other, we've never had so many disagreements. But I'm not disagreeing with you. Good, then let's change the subject. Or better still, let's let's let everything take a rest. If that's what you want, fine. Laurie, what are you doing? Nothing. Laurie, what are you doing with that ring? Nothing, I said. Besides, you don't want to talk about it. Why are you wearing it? I was playing with it. I just wanted to see if it fit. Will you please take it off? What are you getting so excited about? That ring. If you can't throw it away, at least put it away. You're getting awfully bossy, Joe. You're doing it only to get a rise out of me. You can forget about it, because I'm going to give it to that thrift shop around the corner from where I live. Great idea. Now please take it off. All right. Anything for some peace. <sighs> hey, that's funny. What is? The ring's stuck. I, I'll get it off. You shouldn't have put it on if it was too small. But it wasn't. In fact, it felt too big. Isn't that strange? I, I can't even twist it. Get the flashlight out of the glove compartment. Oh. Now turn it on and hold your finger under the light. There. Can you see it? Your finger. Doesn't look swollen. No, it isn't swollen. But but the ring won't budge. George, George, do you hear something? Hear what? That voice, the singing. Don't you hear it? No, I don't. Wait. Yes, I do. It's that song. Where's it coming from? I don't know. It seems to be surrounding us. I'll turn the bright lights on. You keep trying to get that ring off. Um, I am trying, but it's as if it's cemented to my finger. And that singing. It's the same as the girls in the forest. Get rid of the flash and give me your hand. What for? Maybe I can get it off. Well, you can't. You're trying. There's no traffic, Laurie. I can manage the wheel with one hand. Why don't we wait till we get to a gas station? Then I can get it off with a little soap. Come on, give me your hand. All right. No, wait. I can't. Why not? Oh, I just can't, George. Lori, you're about to drive me out of my head. Why can't you give me your hand? Because, because I remembered something. What, for heaven's sake? What, Lori? Well, what Helena said back there, when when she wanted me to take the ring. She said a lot of hysterical things. That if she couldn't give the ring to a Rostin. It would have to be to a person nearest and dearest to her. Oh, Helena's all whacked up. Now give me your hand, Laurie. But what if it's true? Oh, that voice, that terrible voice. Why doesn't it stop? Laurie, please give me your hand. No, because if you can get it off, then you'll be stuck with it. Who cares? I don't want anything to happen to you. Not for anything. <gasps> George! George, look straight ahead. Oh, it's them, no. the two of them, the old man and the girl. He's got an axe. I'm stopping the car. No, don't. Go around them. Throw them. Throw them down. Kill them. Do anything. The brakes George. aren't working. George, we're practically on top of them. Well, then, for the last time, give me your hand. The ring can't harm us. No. Laurie. Are you all right? It was a tree we hit. Only, only a tree, Laurie. You hear me? Only a tree. Laurie, the ring. The ring. What did you do? Not on your finger. Your 
finger. Good Lord. She's dead. So you gave Laurie the ring, Eleanor. Yes, Mother. As you told me to. Now give me the box. And we'll see if the ring has worked wonders once more. Here is the box. The one with the roses. Open it. Yes, Mother. But the music. Why isn't the music playing? It's a good sign that it's not playing. It's the sign that the ring has done its work. Your friend Laurie will not marry ever. Not ever. But the ring, Mother. Where is the ring? You'll find it in the woods. In the clearing. In the same place where I killed your great-grandfather 143 years ago. Go and bring back the ring. It will keep us alive forever. Forever. Forever, you ghosts. Forever, you sing. But your death is as forever as your grim, rosy ring. I'll be back shortly. Let us end our tale of ring a ring of roses. For as we also know, roses are red, roses are blue. But the rose of death is meant for who? Our cast included Glynis O'Connor, George Petrie, Sidney Walker, Elspeth Eric, Holland Taylor, and Carol Hilliard. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs>